Well, greetings, brethren. It's a privilege to be here with you in Charlotte. You know, times are changing. I haven't been traveling very much. Mr. Ames was actually in Texas last weekend. My son was in Atlanta, and now Dr. Meredith's been invited to Pakistan. <laughs> and I've been told to stay home. <laughs> but it is a privilege to be here, especially to share the pulpit on the day before Father's Day with my son. I think that's a very special privilege. I guess since he gave the sermonette, I'm giving the sermon. I'm following in his footsteps. <laughs> You know, we were out to lunch yesterday with Mr. Ames and Dr. Meredith, and uh, Dr. Meredith was joking, I think, with Mr. Ames. He said, you know, it's really nice to have Dr. Winnell in town once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was on the internet with uh, Mr. Meredith's son, Jim, in California yesterday and talking about some feast things, and he mentioned, he said, when are you coming to California? And I wrote him back and I said, when your dad quits persecuting me about traveling, maybe I can make another trip. <laughs> no, it is a privilege to be here with you today. It's amazing how much water, how much rain we have received this year. Everything is very green. And I remember a year or two ago that uh, you know, things were dying because it was so dry. <clears throat> what I'd like to do in the sermon today is to ask several questions to begin with. But I'd like you to think about and think about seriously as we go through the sermon. Has it ever bothered you or have you ever been embarrassed or ashamed that the church that you belong to, the church of God, teaches things that are so diametrically different to the other churches in this world? And that what you believe is very different from about 2 billion other Christians. Has that ever bothered you? Has it ever embarrassed you? Another question, do you know why these major differences exist? Why do we teach things that are so diametrically different? Why? A third question, do you have the confidence and the courage to be different? Do you have the confidence and the courage to be different? Even under pressure. Even under pressure. What can you do to build more confidence and courage? And the last question I want to ask is, why is it important to you and to your future to carefully consider these questions? Why is it important to you and to your future to carefully consider these questions? In the sermon today, I'd like to discuss a number of important differences between the teachings of the Church of God and professing Christian churches of this world. I want to run through those differences rather quickly to focus on some other things. But I want to explain why these differences exist. Why do they exist? And I want to focus then finally on what does this mean to you? And what are the implications of these things to you and your future? I've entitled the sermon a different gospel and a different mission. A different gospel and a different mission. And before we get into the sermon, I'd like to make just a few comments about taking notes. You know, over the years, many people have taken notes, but many of you have been in a church for 20 or 30 years or more. And what we talk about in many cases is not really new to you. You know, so you don't bother taking notes. In some cases, some of you have photographic memories, and you don't need to take notes because you remember everything. But that's not most of us. <laughs> you know, most of us forget. And I find as I get older, I forget more. <clears throat> but, you know, it's not uncommon to have a conversation with someone, and they say, well, you know, Mr. Crockett or, or Mr. Ames or Dr. Meredith gave a really good sermon last week. What do you talk about? Well, I, I don't, I forget. 
but it was good. <laughs> but you know, we need to remember, we need to remember what we hear and what we talk about. <clears throat> You know, because whenever we just listen kind of passively, you know, it goes in one ear and basically comes out another ear. But that's what happens when we listen passively. But when we listen actively, when you're writing things down and going to the scriptures, and then you go back after services, maybe during the week, and you go through your sermon notes and you underline and you look up the scriptures again, you are embedding these things in your mind. You know, the more senses that you use to listen, to write, to look up things, the more deeply you're going to remember these things. It just makes a deeper impression in your mind. You know, we have been called to become teachers, to teach mankind God's way of life. I found when I was in graduate school, <clears throat> I really began to learn my subjects better when I knew I was going to teach them. <laughs> the next day, as opposed to just study for an exam. You study for an exam, you, you recognize the answers. But when you're going to be teaching something, you've got to understand concepts. You've got to understand what's in people's minds. And you learn more thoroughly. And we've been called to become teachers. You might say, well, I, I'm never going to be a minister. How do you know? How do you know? You know, Isaiah chapter... 30 verses 20 and 21 says people will see their teachers in the coming kingdom of God. They're going to see you. And those teachers are going to say, this is the way. This is the way. Now let me explain it to you and let me explain the benefits of this. You know, so there are real benefits now of learning what it is that you believe so that you can explain it and teach it. You know, when I first came into the church, I can remember, remember, remember memorizing the names of the evangelists, most of which are not around anymore, and memorizing various things. And I thought, well, they're the ministers. Now I are one. <laughs> you know, you just project ahead 10, 15, 20, 30 years, whether it's in this life or in the coming kingdom of God. God is training now people to become teachers and educators, to literally turn the world upside down, just as the apostles did, and to say, this is the way. Walk you in it. This is the truth. And this is what happened to the truth. And to be able to explain that. So I would really encourage you, you know, take some notes. <clears throat> you know, I've gotten out of the habit of doing this, but I need to get back into the habit of getting a notebook and then keeping the sermons together so you've got a, a, a library of sermons on various subjects and then leave some space in the front page or two and make an index so that you can look these things up and then go back and use this information. You know, I grew up attending churches, as many of you did. You, know, the, you showed up uh, five minutes before church and you listened to a 10 or 15 minute sermonette and then you shook a few hands and then you're out the door. In fact, some of these churches today, you drive around town, don't get near their exit driveway <laughs> five minutes after church is out because it's a racetrack, people coming out of there. You know, we're here for two hours. We're in teaching sermons. We're having an incredible opportunity to learn and to grow. I would encourage you to take advantage of these opportunities. You know, make some notes, write them down, and go home and review those things. And prepare to become teachers, as we were talking about, uh, or as a little comment that I made in the, the bulletin this week. <clears throat> what I'd like to do first in the sermon is to talk just a little bit about some of the major differences <clears throat> between the Church of God and the churches of this world. If you're taking notes, you might want to write down these differences very quickly. I'm going to go over 12 of them. Maybe put one difference per line and then leave half that line empty because I want to come back and look at these things for just a minute. You know, most people that come in contact with the Church of God, whether it's through the magazine, over the television broadcast, uh, maybe it's through a friend, 
uh, or over the internet. It doesn't take them very long to realize these people are really different. This church is really different. Yes, they believe in God. They believe in Jesus Christ. But number one, they don't keep Sunday. They keep the Sabbath. And they keep the holy days. Number two, they follow those, those, those Jewish dietary laws, or at least we thought they're Jewish. But these are major differences that people pick up on immediately. We don't keep Sunday. We keep the Sabbath. We keep the holy days. We follow the dietary laws that many people think are all Jewish. Another thing that we d don't do, we don't keep Christmas and we don't keep Easter. And these are shocking. These are shocking because most people think Jesus was born on Christmas and they keep Easter. But people notice these differences right up front. You know, Christmas and Easter are major holidays in the Christian religion that people keep today. And if you don't keep them, they begin to ask, do you believe in Jesus Christ? I remember a guy asked me, they said, do you believe in Christ? And I said, yes. He said, well, you don't keep Christmas. I said, he wasn't born on Christmas. <laughs> That's why we don't keep it. But he was dumbfounded. He couldn't put it all together. Yet you know, we don't believe in going to heaven. And yet many people sing about going to heaven, walking on the streets of gold and sitting on a cloud playing a harp. But we don't teach those things. And many people can't understand. What, what, what do you believe then if you don't believe something as basic as that? We don't believe that people roast forever in hell. And yet that's a big subject in some churches because that's the way they keep people in their church. You don't come back, you're going to burn in hell forever. You know, and a lot of preachers get a lot of mileage out of that. <laughs> you know, I've heard them, you've heard them. But we don't teach that. Why not? Another difference, we don't believe in a trinity. And yet that is fundamental for many people. I remember talking with a young fellow up in New England years ago. He'd come across the broadcast or the magazine, and uh, he wanted to visit. So I stopped by to visit him. He said, uh, I just want to know one or two things. He said, do you believe in a trinity? I said, no. He said, then we don't need to talk any further because that's fundamental. He'd read it in a paperback book. I said, no, we don't believe. It's not in your Bible. But it's here in this book. I said, I can't help what's there. But he said, that's not what we teach. And people can't understand that in many cases. We don't believe that the Holy Spirit is a person. We don't believe that the Holy Spirit is a person, yet many people believe that. Many sincere people believe these things. You know, we don't believe in a rapture. And that may be one reason why some people are a little bit more nonchalant about Christ's return. Well, we know we're going to be raptured away. We don't have to worry about anything. But we don't believe that. Another thing we don't believe in is infant baptism. I mean, you didn't have your kids baptized? No. Why not? Everybody does, but we don't. We believe the reward of the saved is, I think has already been mentioned, is to reign with Jesus Christ on this earth in the coming kingdom of God. That's very different. Very different. As I've expressed many times, I grew up in other churches, never heard sermons about the kingdom of God. I thought it was this warm, fuzzy feeling in your heart or your stomach or wherever. <laughs> but it was astounding to learn what the kingdom of God is all about, what our future is all about. One of the things that turns many people off is that they learn that we tithe. Oh, no, that's not for me. But we do it for a reason. And you know, that's one of the difficulties that some people are having coming back to the church is that they've stopped tithing. And if they come back, they realize, I'm going to give up a tenth of my income. I've learned how to live without doing that. 
And that's going to be a hurdle to get over. The final thing I'll mention is that we don't believe that Mary is a mediator between human beings and God. And yet many people do. They pray to Mary because Mary is, is a mother and she understands us better. So we can then ask Mary to intervene. But we don't believe those things. But you know, when people come across the church and they come to understand these major differences, it's very easy to jump to the conclusion these people have got to be a cult. They've got to be a cult because these beliefs and teachings are so different. They're so different from what two billion other Christians believe. They, they've got to be a cult. And once that label is there, I don't want anything to do with that group of people because they're a cult. You look up the word. What does the word cult mean? is defined by dictionaries as a system of religious belief regarded as unorthodox. See, it, it's abnormal. It's not what everybody else believes. It's erroneous. It's not genuine. Another way of defining that, a cult is any group that differs from the mainstream. What's interesting, if the mainstream is wrong, then the odiousness of, of this word cult disappears because if the mainstream is wrong then you don't want to be part of that yeah but some people are tripped up by this they well this is a cult this, this is something you don't want to be a part of and they leave it at that instead of looking into why are these differences there why do these people believe what they believe what does the Bible have to say about these subjects? What does history reveal about these issues? And this is why Mr. Armstrong has said, why Dr. Meredith has said, and others have said, you don't believe us. Look in the book and look at history and see what is there. I remember when I came in contact with the church, began to learn some of these things. Heard Mr. Armstrong say those things. And I spent, I think, the first month in the library every Sabbath because I didn't know what else to do. About eight hours. Opened up about 9 o'clock in the morning, closed about 9 o'clock at night. And that was where I was most of the, of, of the Sabbath. Checking into this, checking into that. And it was astounding what was there and what you find. Now, if you left some space on those lines that we were talking about, <laughs> where I listed the, the differences, let's go back and just touch on each one of these very quickly. You know, why do we keep the Sabbath instead of Sunday? Well, there's no biblical command to keep Sunday. It's just not there. It says, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Jesus Christ kept the Sabbath. The apostles kept the Sabbath. Acts 17, 2. You know, Paul was writing there about 30 years after the crucifixion. He was keeping the Sabbath as his custom was. Jesus Christ kept the holy days. The apostles kept the holy days. The early church kept the Sabbath and the holy days for upwards of three centuries. Until Constantine, around 325, passed legislation saying that if you continue to Judaize, keep Sunday, keep the holy days, you will lose your property. You will be arrested. You'll be persecuted. The early church wasn't liberated from the Sabbath. <laughs> they were persecuted. And people gave up keeping these days. This is a matter of history. You know, so this is why we teach these things. This is why we do these things. When it comes to the dietary laws... <clears throat> You know, God mentioned in Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14, he was putting a nation together. He wanted that nation to be a light and an example to the world. And he said, these are the things that you eat. Now, he's dealing with people coming out of Egypt that ate almost everything. He said, these are the things that you eat and these are the things you don't eat. What's interesting is that when Peter had the vision in Acts chapter 10, 
You know, the sheet came down, had animals in it, and he was told to kill and eat. Peter's response, what was it? Now, Peter had been with Christ for three and a half years. He should have known it was all okay. He said, Lord, I've never eaten anything. Never eaten anything that was common or unclean. Peter's conclusion at the end of that vision was not, hey, <laughs> we can go eat shrimp tonight. His conclusion was, God has shown me not to call any man, any human being, a Gentile, common or unclean. Yet God did not change biological laws when Jesus Christ died on the cross. You know, clams and oysters are unclean because they're little garbage cans. They <laughs> suck up everything that goes by. Viruses, bacteria, heavy metals, whatever. They still were doing the same thing <laughs> after the crucifixion. The biological laws never changed. And the people that eat those things still get sick. There was something in the paper just recently that uh, heavy rains up in Boston, they closed the uh, oyster beds up there because the sewers overflow whenever there's heavy rains. And the oysters and clams are sitting there, mm -hmm, this is really good today. <laughs> and then we eat those things. See, the biological laws never changed. When Jesus Christ returns, check the scriptures yourselves, Isaiah 66, verses 15 through 17. Isaiah 66, verses 15 through 17. It says, when Christ returns, those people that are eating unclean things are going to have... <laughs> have some difficulties to deal with. They've got to be re-educated. Where you explain, as God did to the Israelites, these are things to eat, these are things you don't eat. You know, this is why we follow these principles. This is why we follow these instructions. Why do we not keep Christmas or Easter? Again, there's no command in the Bible to keep Christmas. There's no command in the Bible to keep Easter. These were pagan holidays that were absorbed into the church. You want an interesting Bible study? Read Deuteronomy chapter 12. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 29 to 31, where God says to the Israelites, when you go into these lands I'm giving you, don't ask how they worship their gods because they've done all kinds of crazy things. Don't ask how they do it. And don't worship me that way. Isaiah, excuse me, in Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 through 14, says pretty much the same thing. And then in Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, God says through Jeremiah, don't learn the way of the heathen. Don't learn those things and don't do those things to me. So the Bible is very clear on these things. You know, I grew up keeping Christmas, keeping Easter, and I thought I was very spiritual doing those things because everybody else was doing that. And I felt good doing those things until I realized the Bible says something very different. Very different. What about going to heaven? You know, we believe that that doesn't happen based on the scriptures. Acts chapter 2, verse 34, Jesus, excuse me, Peter is speaking on Pentecost and he said, you know, David is dead and buried. David isn't in heaven. And you think <laughs> if anybody's in heaven, David's got to be there because he was a man after God's own heart. And yet it's mentioned in Acts chapter 13, verse 36. Statement is made, David is dead and buried. He's, his body's decayed. He's not in heaven. John mentions in chapter 3, verse 13, no one has ascended into heaven except the one who came down from heaven, which is Jesus Christ. And this is why we teach these things, because the Bible is very plain on these things. As far as people roasting in hell forever, read what Malachi says in chapter 4 first three verses there it talks about the wicked will be ashes under the feet of the righteous when Jesus Christ returns you can't be burning forever in hell and be ashes at the same time it just doesn't work 
it doesn't work. You know, and many people today are coming to believe, oh, they, don't, they don't believe in that there's a righteous God in heaven that would burn people up and just burn them forever and ever and ever, roasting them on a slow rotisserie. This is not God. It's not the mind of God. These ideas came out of Dante's writings in the Middle Ages. And when you look at some of these cathedrals in Europe that were built during the Middle Ages with the gargoyles and all these, <laughs> you know, ugly things, this is not the mind of God. This is not the mind of God. This is satanic, weird stuff. And yet there are thousands and thousands of people that go into these cathedrals and worship and cry and, you know, and they feel, I'm sure, very spiritual. But they've been misled. They've been pointed in a wrong direction. And so we don't believe these things. We don't teach these things. We don't believe in a trinity. What's interesting, I didn't bring the book with me, but the Oxford Companion to the Bible makes this statement. The term trinity is not found in the New Testament. This fundamental doctrine is not found in the New Testament and says the concept you're unable to find in the scriptures. It's just not there. It came from paganism. This is why we don't teach these things. This is why we have a major difference. And you can go down through the list. It's, it just continues to go. We don't believe uh, the Holy Spirit is a person. You can check the salutations of all of Paul's epistles. He said, I'm writing to you in the name of the Father and the name of the Son, Jesus Christ. And he omits any reference to the Holy Spirit as a person. It's just not there. So we don't believe these things. We don't teach those things. You know, we don't believe in a rapture. There's no scripture that plainly teaches that. There's just simply no scripture that plainly teaches that. Notice what is taught. Let's just take a minute here. The scriptures do talk about the church or believers are going to be protected from the tribulation. That is, some of them will. Revelation chapter 3. Just notice a couple verses quickly. Talking about the promise to the Philadelphia era of the church. Notice in verse 8, it says, I know your works. So this group of people is going to have works. See, I've set before you an open door. We have an internet today. We have television today. The apostles had no access to anything like that. They had to, to walk on their feet wherever they went. And they could speak to whatever group that they could talk to. And it's amazing to me how when you look back at American history and some of these other histories of other nations, how one person could speak to audiences of thousands without any amplification. They had better lungs than we do. <laughs> but how that happens, it's, it's remarkable. We're up on Tara, the hill there in Ireland. Apparently they had big political rallies there in the 1800s. And they spoke to five or 10,000 people gathered around there. How they heard, I have no idea. Unless the speaker had one incredible voice. But we have tools to work with today that the apostles never had. I know your works. See, I've set an open door before you that no one can shut. You have a little strength. You're not a big church. You have a little strength, but you've kept my word to preach the gospel to the world. And you've not denied my name, my teachings. Down in verse 10, because you have kept my command to persevere, you've continued doing what I've asked you to do. I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which will come upon the whole world. He's talking about the tribulation. I'm going to protect you. Now, some people assume there's going to be a, a rapture. But notice in chapter 12, where it comes back, uh, talking about this woman that's going to be protected, persecuted and protected. It's not talking about going off to heaven. In chapter 12, verse 16, it says, but the earth helped the woman. It's not talking about the clouds helping the woman. It's not talking about being raptured up into the sky. It says the earth helped the woman. And it appears there's going to be a place of protection somewhere on this earth. And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood. These are the 
armies of the persecuting dragon. But notice what else is here. It says the dragon was enraged with the woman. You know, that woman is proclaiming the truth about the identity of the dragon and the identity of the beast and the identity of the false prophet. <laughs> That's going to stir up a lot of problems. But the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring that were not helped by the earth who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. There's going to be a portion of the church, a portion of the believers that are not protected. And we'll find out why they're not protected. It was basically referring to Laodiceans who are kind of laid back and it's no big deal, you know, and we don't have to do this, we don't have to do that. The Bible does talk about protection, but it talks about the earth helping the woman, not the clouds, not going off to heaven, you know, planes crashing and bus crashing because the, the drivers were raptured away. This is an escape mechanism. But the Bible doesn't teach those things. As far as infant baptism goes, you might want to make some notes in your own Bible. And you do your own research, but I've got mine basically in Mark chapter 1. The Bible indicates that only adults are baptized. Children are blessed. You know, we've had our children blessed when they were little. You probably had yours. You know, they're not repenting whenever they're blessed. All we're doing is asking that God would watch over those children. Repentance and conversion comes later when a person is old enough to do those things. You know, Acts chapter 8, verse 12, it talks about men and women were baptized, not children, but people that are old enough to repent and understand what it means to turn around and go in a different direction and to be sorry for what they've done wrong. That's what baptism is all about. You repent, you're baptized, you receive God's spirit because you've changed and you want to go in a different direction. Infant baptism came into the church from Egypt around 400 or so A.D. Let me just get to those notes quickly. Infant baptism began in North Africa in the, second, but in the third century. So this would be 250, 275, something like that. It became general in the church by the time of Augustine around 400 A.D. And then universal in the sixth century in the 500s. It became compulsory by an edict of Justinian between 527 and 565. This is when infant baptism came into the church. It's interesting the people called Anabaptists. They were against child, uh, child baptism. And my mom's parents came from Switzerland. They were Anabaptists. <laughs> they were part of these dissenters, rebels, you know, against the Catholic Church, came out of Switzerland at that time. And they believed that only adults should be baptized. This was part of the Reformation, part of trying to get the church back on track. And yet, this is done widely today. It, it's a custom to have children baptized when they don't really understand what's going on. So these are a number of things, a number of differences, a number of the reasons why. In terms of tithing, you know, Jesus mentioned in Matthew 23, 23, told the Pharisees, you know, you're, you're nitpicking on all kinds of things. You tithe on mint and anise and cumin, and those things you should have done. You should be tithing. If you're going to be keeping the holy days, how do you go to the feast if you're not saving second tithe? You know, keeping the feast and tithing come together. People are going to be keeping the feast we know in the coming kingdom of God, Zechariah 14. The nation that doesn't come up to Jerusalem to keep the feast is not going to get any rain. They're going to be tithing <laughs> so they can keep the feast. I mean, this, this is logical. It all fits together. And this thing about uh, Mary, uh, we don't believe as a mediator between God and human beings. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, says there is one God and one mediator, Jesus Christ. And yet I've seen in the news, you may have seen it, that there's a movement within the Catholic Church to petition the Pope. Please make Mary the mediatrix. You know, designate her as a co-mediator with Jesus Christ. 
This is not how you establish doctrine by petitioning the Pope and getting a big popular movement. The scriptures say there's one mediator. And this is why we don't do these things. I wanted to run through these things just to very quickly remind us, because I think I'm preaching to the choir here, and I know that. <laughs> but it doesn't hurt to review. You know, it was the uh, football coach of the, uh, who was it, Vince Lombardi, the, uh, was it the team that he was coaching? Green Bay Packers. Green Bay Packers. There we go. <laughs> Mr. Ames must be a Packer fan. <laughs> But, you know, he began his lectures in the fall every year to professional football players who are being paid thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars. He said, gentlemen, this is a football. <laughs> you know, we've got people to get upset whenever we say, look, we'd like to give you some guidelines on giving sermonettes. We've been speaking for 20 years. We don't need guidelines. And yet, you know, Vince Lombardi got away with it. He said, gentlemen, this is a football. If you're going to win games, you've got to protect it. You can't fumble it. You can't let it go. You've got to hold on to it. You've got to get it across the goal line. He went over basics. You know, I played basketball a lot in high school. And our coach would sit us down every fall and go over the basics of defense and the basics of offense. He says, guys, people that forget the basics lose games. They lose games. So we need to review from time to time to understand not only that there are differences, but I want to take just a little bit of time and talk about why are those differences there? Why are those differences there? Because when I began to look into these things, I was surprised what I could find. The evidence is there. The scriptures are there, which I was never told about before. Why does the church of God believe and teach so differently on these basic doctrines? Is, it, is this biblical? Is this what God intended? That we be very different? Notice a couple of scriptures. In Matthew chapter 13, where Christ was speaking in parables, you should be familiar with the scriptures. Matthew 13, let's start in verse 2, to put it in context. Verse 1, it says, On the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, and great multitudes were gathered together to him. So he got in a boat, kind of went out a little ways from shore, and then began teaching them. But here were multitudes of people surrounding Jesus Christ, and he spoke in parables. Then down in verse 10, the disciples came to him and said, Why do you speak to them in parables? And notice what Jesus said. Because it has been given to you to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. You, as my disciples, have been given an opportunity to understand about the coming kingdom of God. He said, but to them, the multitudes, that understanding has not been given yet, basically. They will have their opportunities down the road. Verse 14, and in them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, hearing you will hear, but not understand. Seeing you will see, but not perceive. The heart of this people has grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes have closed. They have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Lest they should understand in their heart and with their heart in turn, and that I should heal them. Then he says, blessed, fortunate, privileged, to be envied are you, are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. God was calling a group of people, not large, but small. He said, I'm giving you an understanding I'm not giving to the world just yet. And I hope we can all appreciate the fact that God has opened your mind to enable you to understand what you do, otherwise you wouldn't be here. I mean, why come on Saturday when everybody else comes on Sunday? Why give up Christmas? Saves a lot of money. I mean, why would you do something unless God has opened your mind to understand these things? This is what Christ said very plainly to his disciples. 
John 17, we read this every year at the Passover. But do we really grasp what we're reading and what we're part of? Beginning in John 13, Jesus began discussing a number of fundamental things with his disciples. He wanted them to understand before he died. In John 17, Christ prays to his Father, and this is an instructive prayer. He's teaching at the same time that he's praying. Beginning in verse 6, I have manifested or I have revealed your name to the men whom you have given me out of this world. To those that you've given me. It appears there were at least 12 of these men at the Passover, maybe a few others. After three and a half years, he had a dozen, maybe more. You know, in Acts, it mentions there were 120 disciples in, there in Jerusalem before Pentecost. That's just a little bit less than the people we have in this room. And that was after three and a half years of a miraculous ministry. Jesus is mentioning here, I, I, I revealed your truth to the men that you've given me out of this world. Not big numbers. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have kept your word. Verse eight, for I have given them the words which you have given me. Down in verse 9, now think about this. I pray for them, this group of people. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they're yours. You know, Jesus Christ was calling and training a small group of people that would become the nucleus of a church that would grow, and he says in Matthew 16, 18, would continue to exist until Jesus Christ returns. It's called a small group of people, a persecuted group of people, not a big group of people. This is what you have been called to become part of. Not because we're any better than anybody else. So there should be no chips on anybody's shoulders. We're here by the mercy of God to be called and trained and prepared to reign with Jesus Christ in the coming kingdom of God. That's pretty sobering. It's also exciting. Notice also in John 17, beginning in verse 14. Again, Christ is praying to the Father, and he's sharing concepts with these individuals who were there with him at the Passover. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them probably called him a cult, a bunch of other names. Jesus Christ, a rabble rouser. He was turning the world upside down. That's what the apostles were accused of a little bit later. The world has hated them, made fun of them, because they're not of this world. They're not orthodox. <laughs> they're not doing things the way everybody else is doing it. They're not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. The word sanctify means set apart. Set them apart for special use. But what it's saying is you set them apart by your truth. And it's really the truth of the Sabbath, the truth of the holy days, the truth of these other doctrines that sets the church of God apart from, literally, the rest of the world. And some people say, well, you're just all exclusivist, and you think you're all right, and so on. What do you do with the Sabbath when you know Christ kept it, the apostles kept it, the early church kept it, and it was kept until the Roman Empire and the Catholic Church got involved and said, we're going to persecute you. We're going to persecute anybody that continues to do these things, and most people gave it up, except those that fled to the mountains and fled to the far parts of the empire where there was a semblance of peace and safety and a lack of persecution. 
You know, what happened to the Waldensians, the Albigensians, Cathars in southern France, northern Italy? You know, the Pope launched a crusade against these people. They buried some of these people alive, and then they drove plows over top of them. This is what happened to people that continued to want to keep the Sabbath and keep the holy days and to follow the teachings of Jesus Christ. This is what happened. This is history. But Jesus said, sanctify these people, set them apart by your truth. And that's what the truth does. It does set you apart. And that's why I ask in the beginning, have you ever been embarrassed by the teachings of the church? Has it ever bugged you, bothered you? Because you're believing things that the world doesn't believe. But the world doesn't understand why they believe what they do. They don't understand what has happened in history in many cases, or they're not interested. First Corinthians chapter seven, this again is a theme that was not only Jesus Christ mentioned these things, but Paul mentions these things in his epistles. First Corinthians chapter one. <clears throat> Verses 26 and 27. Now, Paul is writing to the church of Corinth. And this would like to be writing to people today in New York or Los Angeles. Corinth was a big, bustling city. A lot of things going on, a lot of ideas floating around. But Paul mentions to these people, he said, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. You know, you'll be laughed at if you keep the Sabbath. You'll be laughed at if you don't keep Christmas. You'll be made fun of if you don't believe in some of these doctrines today. And yet Paul is saying, you see your calling, brethren. God has opened your mind to understand certain things. He's not opening the minds of the world to understand these things. Verse 7, chapter 2. Again, this theme runs through the books. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age, leaders, thinkers, educators, movers and shakers, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. You know, the religious leaders in Paul's time didn't understand the teachings of Jesus Christ. They saw him as a threat. Verse 10, but God has revealed these things to us through his spirit. Now we're told in the scriptures, God gives his spirit to those who obey him, who follow his instructions, who keep the Sabbath, who keep the laws of God. For the spirit searches all things, just the deep things of God. Down to verse 14, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him. You keep those Old Testament things? You do those things? Doesn't make sense to most people. But he who is spiritual, who has God's Spirit, judges or evaluates or understands all things. Paul makes some other statements in 2 second, in, uh, second Corinthians 6, verse 17. Just to illustrate, this is the theme that runs through the scriptures. The implication is God's church is never going to be large and big. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 17 and 18, Paul is telling the church in Corinth, come out from among them and be separate. You know, don't go drifting down the river with everybody else. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Don't touch what's unclean and I'll receive you. I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters. You're going to be part of my family. You can't do what everybody else does. You just can't do it that way. Brethren, this is why the church of God is different. We've been commanded to come out of this world, to do things differently. 
not to just drift down the river with everybody else, but to hold on to the truth that Jesus Christ revealed. Why do professing Orthodox Christians, another question, believe so differently? Why do they believe so differently? Why do they keep Christmas? Why do they do this? Why do they do that? What has led up to these things? Now, a standard argument is, well, we are not under the old covenant anymore. We have been liberated from those things. We're under a new covenant. But, you know, that leaves a number of issues begging, leaves a number of questions unanswered. If the Christian world today is under a new covenant, why did the early church and the apostles keep the Sabbath and the holy days and the dietary laws for centuries, for centuries after Jesus Christ was crucified? They were under a new covenant too. But they continued to keep the Sabbath. They continued to keep the holy days. They didn't buy into infant baptism. They didn't go along with idol worship. They didn't do a lot of those things. Why? If they'd been liberated. See, this doesn't make sense. But history explains why the churches of this world are very different. We were talking at lunch yesterday, and Dr. Meredith mentioned this book, The Story of the Christian Church by Jesse Lyman Hurlbut. Dr. Hurlbut had a Doctor of Divinity degree. He was a, and this is an interesting one, he's an American Methodist Episcopal clergyman. How do you be a Methodist Episcopal clergyman? <laughs> you're usually an Episcopalian or you're a Methodist. But this guy was, was both. Uh, but writing in his book, he makes some very interesting observations. Talking about what happened to the early church. He says, we named the last generation of the first century, roughly from around 70 to 120 or 150 AD, the age of shadows, because the gloom of persecution was over the church, but more especially because all of all periods of history, it's the one about which we know the least. We don't really know what happened to the church for a 50, 60, 70 year period. We no longer have the clear light of the book of Acts to guide us, and no authority of that age has filled the blank in history. It says, for 50 years after St. Paul's life, so it would bring you about 62, 3, 4 AD, up until about 100, 120 AD, I'm just using dates here very roughly, a curtain hangs over the church through which we strive vainly to look. But when it last arises about 120 A.D., with the writings of the earliest church fathers, we find a church in many respects very different, very different from the days of St. Peter and St. Paul. What happened to the early church? Why was it so different 50 years after the death of the apostles Peter and Paul? He goes on a little bit later in the book, talks about the triumph of Christianity whenever Constantine got involved through the weight of the Roman Empire behind the organized Orthodox Church at that time. It says, with the triumph of Christianity resulted, but while the triumph of Christianity resulted in much that was good, they stopped the gladiatorial games and uh, you know, g slaves were treated better and things like that. Inevitably, the alliance of the state and the church also brought in its train many evils. Ceasing, the ceasing of persecution was a blessing, but the establishment of Christianity as a state religion became a curse. Everybody sought membership in the church, especially whenever they were tax-free. <laughs> uh, their salaries went up. Uh, they were uh, uh, courted by the Roman emperor. In other words, it was a thing to do. Everybody sought membership in the church, and nearly everybody was received, both good and bad, sincere seekers after God and hypocritical seekers after gain, rushed into communion. Ambitious, worldly, unscrupulous men sought office in the church for social and political influence. I was talking with some 
the men in a board meeting in one of the islands down in the Caribbean, Caribbean recently. And I said, how big was your church years ago? And he said, hundreds of people. I said, where'd they all go? He said, well, they're all over the place. I said, why did they leave? He said, well, years ago when the church was bigger, it was of social benefit to be in the church because you were something if you were a deacon. You were something if you were that, this or that or the other thing. He said, when the church came apart, he said, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, such a big deal to be part of the church. And that was his comment. It wasn't mine. Same thing happened in the early church. People came into the church because it was the thing to do. Not because of what they believed, what they taught. It says the services of worship increased in splendor, but were less spiritual and hearty than those of former times. The forms and ceremonies of paganism gradually crept into worship. Some of the old heathen feasts became church festivals. Sunday, Christmas, Easter, some of the saints' days, with a change of name and change of worship. About 405 A.D., images of the saints and martyrs began to appear in the churches. The adoration of the Virgin Mary was substituted for the worship of Venus and Diana. Now, you've been watching recently, I think it was last year, it was a time or Newsweek, had a big cover article on Mary and how many Protestant churches are beginning to incorporate the worship of Mary and look to Mary. It's unbelievable what's happening today. People don't even notice. It's just, well, it's, it's happening. It's no big deal. And yet we're going back to things that the Bible says we should never do. As a result of the church sitting in power, we do not see Christianity transforming the world to its own ideal, but the world dominating the church. And this was Hurlbut's comments. You can read the same thing in uh, this volume by Will Durant, Caesar and the Christ, The Story of Civilization. And he makes a statement, and Durant is a Catholic. He said, Christianity did not destroy paganism it adopted it. It just took it over. These are incredible statements, and yet most people are oblivious to this. Christianity was the last great creation of the ancient pagan world. Now, he's talking about modern Christianity today. Now, that's what history has to say. What does the Bible have to say very quickly? Let's notice a couple things. Jesus warned in Matthew 24 about a number of things. Matthew 24, beginning in verse 3, it says, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us what will be the signs, uh, when will these signs be? He was talking about the destruction of the temple. And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Then Jesus answered and said, Take heed that no one deceives you. Be alert. Don't let people deceive you. Now, many people today are very sincere when they go to church on Sunday. You know, I know. I've been there. I've done that. And when you walk through these cathedrals, whether they're in Europe or churches here in the United States, people are very sincere. But Jesus Christ never worshipped on Sunday. He never kept Christmas. He never commanded us to do these things. And yet many sincere people do those things because they think that's right. Jesus said, don't let people deceive you. Many will come in my name. I'm a Christian. I'm a, I'm a Christian minister. I'm a representative of Jesus Christ saying, I'm the Christ, or I'm representing Christ, and will deceive many people. You know, if God has opened your mind to understand the truth, don't take that lightly. Don't take that for granted. But, you know, Paul is even stronger. If you go to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 
Uh, Corinth was a big city. They had pagan temples there. And it was very tempting to get involved with that worship because they had temple prostitutes. And it was, it was, it was in, enticing to people. And it was hard to give up for some of these people. Begin verse 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Oh, that you would bear with me in my folly. Just, just listen to me, he's saying. And indeed you do bear with me, for I'm jealous for you. With a godly jealousy, I care for you. For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin, a pure person to Jesus Christ. But I fear lest somehow this, as, the saint, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. You know, it looks good, tastes good. Well, it must be good. No. So your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he, talking about these false teachers, comes, preaches another Jesus with long hair that said it's okay to keep Sunday, that you go to heaven when you die, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, and there are different spirits in different organizations, which you have not received, or a different gospel. You don't really think you're going to reign with Jesus Christ on this earth, do you? Well, I'm dumb enough to believe the book, and that's what the book says. <laughs> but if they come preaching a different gospel, a different Jesus, have a different spirit, he says, you know, you may as well put up with it, if that's what you're going to believe. But he's warning the church. And down here in verse 13, 14, 15, Paul gets pretty pointed. For such are false apostles, if they're teaching you these things, deceitful workers transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. We've got people running around today claiming to be apostles and claiming to be prophets and so on. And they've been able to attract a following. Such are false apostles. No wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers, his ministers, also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. Now, they don't believe for a minute that they're ministers of Satan. But Paul says if they're teaching you these things, they're playing into Satan's hands and deceiving people. You know, these are pretty powerful statements. These are some of the reasons why the world is going one way and why the Church of God has gone down through the centuries and still goes in a certain direction. A little bit more time, and I want to talk about another dimension of difference. <clears throat> Another dimension of difference, and it has to do with the mission of the church. What are we supposed to be doing? What did Jesus Christ tell his church that they should be doing? You know, my understanding of most churches, the ones that I grew up in anyways, was that they felt their mission was to get people to accept Jesus and be saved. I remember growing up as a kid and these people coming up and looking down at me. Are you saved, buddy? And I looked up and I, 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 I think so. <laughs> you know, I hope so. But that was the answer that they wanted. But that was generally the question. You know, are you saved? Have you given your heart to the Lord? And they take this as their mission to save everyone so that they're not lost. And yet the mission that Jesus Christ came for was, was a bit different. I mean, that was part of it, but there was another very powerful dimension that is seldom talked about today. In Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. You know, Jesus wasn't walking around, are you saved? You give me your heart. It says, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, about a coming government of God on this earth. That the saints would reign with Jesus Christ on this earth. You know, when I first heard that, I thought, wow, that is exciting. 
That is exciting. He was talking at lunch the other day. Mr. Crockett mentioned one of the Christian preachers today was mentioning that the mainstream Christian churches have failed this modern generation. They've failed this modern generation, but they've not preached what the Bible actually preaches. You know, I was reading an article in Christianity Today a number of years ago where a group of evangelicals were sitting around talking about evangelism. And one guy made the statement, he said, well, if, if our church had a television station, we really wouldn't know what to do other than say, uh, do you know the Lord and have a nice day? I mean, that blows your mind. Jesus Christ came preaching a gospel about a coming kingdom of God, about a government that he's going to set up on this earth to solve the problems that are facing the world. As Mr. Ames pointed out, the Bible, or excuse me, the, the Bible, <laughs> the Charlotte Observer <laughs> had this article about one billion people are facing famine today. One sixth of mankind. Jesus Christ said, one of the signs of my imminent coming is going to be famines and disease epidemics and earthquakes. They're going to impact the world. We had a note in the, um, the world ahead this week about our brethren in the Philippines and saying they lost their rice crop in one area. And they're basically going to be in bad shape. Now, that's one little microcosm in the Pacific. Got another note from one of our members in South Africa talking about a, a wheat virus, uh, a fungus. I think it's designated as UG99. It was a fungus first described in Uganda, UG, and said it has spread over into Kenya, spread up into uh, uh, the Sudan has jumped the Red Sea and is moving up into southern Russia or into Pakistan, that area, wheat-growing area. So the wind will probably blow it into southern Russia and it may blow it to the United States. And said so this fungus, this wheat rust, is capable of destroying 80% of the world's wheat. 80%. This is the times in which we're living you know, Jesus Christ said, watch world events. Don't get caught up in all kinds of church activities. Keep your eyes open. Realize what's happening. I am predicting the future. You know, the church has a prophetic mission, not just to get people into the church, but to warn about events that are coming, not just that Christ is coming back. But there's going to be a series of events that will take place that are going to rock this world its foundations. And part of our job is to explain what's coming and explain there is hope for the future. Yes, things are going to get very difficult. Very difficult. You know, Jesus was preaching about a coming kingdom of God in Matthew chapter 10. He told his disciples, you go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And you preach about a coming kingdom of God. You warn them about what's coming. Jesus was not talking about go to Jerusalem and convert the Jews. He was saying, you go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, all 12 tribes. Tell them who they are. Tell them why they're blessed as they have been blessed. And tell them what is going to happen because they've turned their backs on me. You read the scriptures, Jeremiah, Hosea, Hosea chapter eight, read the whole chapter. He said, you Israelites are a bunch of rebellious people. I gave you my laws and you tell me they're strange. They're strange. We don't want to have anything to do with them. You know, part of our job is to remind our people who we are, why we have been blessed so incredibly. And you go across the border to Mexico, 
You go into the South Pacific, go into the Caribbean, go into Africa, go into Asia. It's very different. Very different. You know, they don't have supermarkets for the most part stocked with shelves like we do. You go to Lowe's, you go to Home Depot, you go to Target, you go to all these stores, and it's loaded with goods. Most people don't live like that. We have been given a privilege to live like that. But we don't understand where the blessings have come from. We don't understand there are responsibilities that come with those blessings. God said, I've blessed you as my people. I want you to be a light and an example to the world. You've not done it. You go back and read Ezekiel chapter 7. He says, your days are over. Disaster after disaster is coming. And it's going to hit you. And then the prophets say, don't even pray for these people. They've had their warning. They're going to have to learn the hard way. Jeremiah says, your leaders have led you astray. They tell you smooth things and you say, hey, let's hear some more of it. You know, our day of reckoning is coming. It is coming because as a nation, we've turned our back on God. We are trying to worship God with pagan practices. He said, don't have, <laughs> don't do that stuff to me. You know, Jesus Christ is coming back to restore all things. Let's turn to Acts chapter 3. This is what the future holds. Jesus Christ is going to come back. He's not going to rapture a bunch of people away. He's going to protect those who he's calling and training to teach the world. But once Christ comes back, sets up his government, he's going to restore everything back to the way it should be. And we're going to have an opportunity to be part of that. You know, if we stay focused on where we need to stay focused and do what we need to do. Acts chapter 3, <clears throat> beginning in verse 19. It says, repent, therefore. See, Jesus Christ came preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, repent. He didn't say, just give me your heart and everything will be fine. He said, you change your life. You turn around and you go in a different direction. Repent, therefore, and be converted. That's what conversion is all about. That your sins may be blotted out so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. This is when the deserts are going to bloom. When people are going to be healed. When sickness is going to be banished. When the laws of God go forth from Jerusalem. And people are told, this is what you can eat. This is what you shouldn't eat. And you're going to be able to prevent a whole lot of problems. I want you to come to the feast and, and see what it's really going to be like in the coming kingdom of God. The times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord that he may send Jesus Christ who has preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, when the earth is going to be filled with the knowledge of God when you are going to have an opportunity to teach and reign with Jesus Christ in the coming kingdom of God and say, this is the way. This is the way that works. This is the way that God wants us to live. And this is the opportunity that you and I are being given right now. We're called out of this world, not to drift down the river just like everybody else is doing. Because that's the easiest way to go. No, if you're going to come out of this world, it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be a challenge. People are going to laugh. They're going to ridicule. They're going to put you down. But if you have proven what the truth is, you know what history records. You know what the facts are. You know it's going to be difficult. But it's also going to be extremely exciting and extremely rewarding to be able to reign with Jesus Christ and to solve the problems that are facing human beings today. There's a big difference between the way the world is going and the way God wants his church to go. Hopefully we can understand that and appreciate it and go the way that God wants us to go.